I got a chance to see inside the Science Museum's enormous storage facility, located just outside the town of Swindon in the southwest of England. And this place is amazing. With 30 kilometers of shelving inside, if you're at all interested in science, engineering, technology, history, or science fiction, you'll be able to find something incredible in this building. Built on an old RAF base, this place contains 300,000 unique items. I was only allowed one hour inside the facility, so if I wanted to see everything that was in there, that would have given me 0.012 seconds per item. In this video, I'm going to take you with me on my visit and show you the coolest things that I saw. After pulling away from London Paddington Station, it was just a quick 50-minute journey through the beautiful English countryside before arriving at Swindon. I stepped out of the station, then hopped into a taxi to take me to the facility. Throughout the drive, I caught glimpses of the massive building on the horizon. As we pulled into the site, we drove past some huge RAF hangars. Then we kept driving further into the 545-acre site, where I caught my first proper glimpse of the purpose-built Hawking Building, named after the legendary Stephen Hawking. It absolutely dwarfed the RAF hangars from earlier. We circled around some herds of sheep, and my driver dropped me off at the entrance. Finally, I was granted access to the main part of the Hawking Building. With an area of 27,000 square meters, the facility is equivalent in size to 600 double-decker buses. Passing through the main doors, I was greeted to a sight of dozens of cars from throughout history. Here's another view from above. Now, I don't know a huge amount about cars, so I'd be interested in hearing from all you petrol heads watching as to what catches your eye here. Just beyond the cars, I saw this. This is a replica of the spacesuit worn by Gene Cernan, who was the commander of Apollo 17 in 1972. As the final Apollo mission, this was the last time that humans went to the moon. Cernan himself has the record for the longest time spent walking on the moon, and, as the last person back in the craft, he was the final person to set foot on the moon. Turning around, I saw this absolute beast. This Tucker snowcat was one of four that were used in the Commonwealth Transantarctica Expedition, which took place in the 1950s. One of the leaders of this expedition was the great Sir Edmund Hillary, who, along with his Sherpa, Tenzing Norgay, was the first man to climb Everest. This expedition was the first ever motorized crossing of the Antarctic, so the snowcats were modified for the extreme temperatures they would face by using special antifreeze engine lubricant sealing every hole and crevice, and covering the cabin with inch-thick cellular plastics, which are special polymers with tiny pockets of air to trap heat. After two months of struggling through the brutal conditions, their successful arrival in January 1958 marked the first time that land vehicles had ever reached the pole. Right next to this, there was a Cyberman costume that was used in Doctor Who in 1988, next to a Dalek. And right behind them was a replica of the robot from the groundbreaking 1927 sci-fi movie, Metropolis. Next up, I saw these menacing looking things. The first one is called General Purpose Vehicle Rocket No. 730. It was built in the early 1950s and was used in developing homing techniques, where the missile would follow a radar beam onto its target. I actually couldn't find much information about this one, so I'd love to read in the comments if anyone knows anything more. The next rocket is called Blue Steel. It was a British air-launched rocket-propelled nuclear missile, which was in service from 1963 to 1970. It could travel at speeds up to three times the speed of sound. It had a maximum range of 240 kilometers or 150 miles, and it carried a 1.1 megaton thermonuclear warhead called Red Snow. Blue Steel was officially retired on the 31st of December 1970, when the United Kingdom's strategic nuclear arsenal was passed to its submarine fleet. Opposite the rockets was an early fire engine, built in 1863, with a pressurized tank at the front for spraying jets of water into burning buildings. Next, I headed upstairs, where the smaller items were kept, and came across several Neolithic tools, including a Neolithic comb that was found in Scotland, and was most likely used for heckling flax. This is where the flax fibers were straightened and impurities were removed to create threads that were ready to be woven into fabrics. 
It's amazing to think that these tools were used thousands of years ago by humans exactly like you and me, who were just trying to survive on the same planet that we live on today, albeit in much harder conditions. After walking past a load of old designs for Bunsen burners, several large molecular models, finally I came across the item that I was most excited about. This was the entire reason that I had arranged this visit. Sitting at the back of this shelf was a simple box made of wood and glass that most people would probably pass by without even noticing. However, this item has an awesome story. This box, made exactly 100 years ago in 1925, is a replica of an even earlier design by the French geologist Alexandre Emile Begouillet de Chancourtois back in 1862. You can see that he had arranged all of the known elements by atomic weight into a spiral. But what was really cool was that when he did this, for some reason, similar elements seemed to coincidentally line up in perfect columns. For example, we can see that lithium, sodium and potassium all line up one on top of the other. Any chemists watching will know that these elements are all very reactive metals who do the exact same reactions as each other with their reactivity increasing as you go down the column. De Jean Courtois couldn't have known the reasons for this at the time, since atomic theory was still in its infancy. However, he had done something incredible. He was the first person on the planet to demonstrate that the elements' properties repeated periodically when you arrange them by atomic weight. This was the first ever periodic table. And it's a helix. How cool is that? If you want to know the full story for how this periodic helix came to be and how it developed into the modern periodic table, I've already got a couple of videos on the topic, so I'll link them both below. I was also able to see one final bonus item, a set of slide rules which were designed by the English chemist William Hyde Wollaston in 1813. I'd never really looked into these before, so if you'd like me to talk more about the Wollaston slide rule in a future video, let me know below. But here's the basics of how it worked. By positioning the slider so that it matched the weight of a particular substance, the rule would tell you exactly how much of another substance it would react with. For example, 26 equivalents of calcium would react with just over 28 equivalents of carbonic acid and with 35 equivalents of muriatic acid, aka hydrochloric acid. These important ratios helped to pave the way for Duchamp Courtois' periodic spiral and the proper periodic table that came after, later in the 1800s. I saw so many amazing treasures during my one hour at the Science and Innovation Park. Let me know what your favourite ones were. The team at the Hawking Building said that I'd be welcome to come back for a future video, so let me know in the comments if there's anything specific that you'd like me to go and check out. Also, if you're looking for more Chemistorian content, you can become a patron to unlock perks such as bonus videos, ad-free videos, early access, behind-the-scenes updates, Q&As, and more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.